Bear Down Bears fans, another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast coming your way. Pat the designer, Courtney Cronin in the building. And listen, we got to continue the conversation from yesterday with a little bit more insight, getting that Hall of Fame game, getting the breakdown on what that's going to mean for this Bears team moving forward. And what is the potential that the Bears could actually move some more draft capital around to try and add pieces to the draft this year? We'll talk about all that and more on today's episode of the Chicago Bears podcast. Hit that like button, subscribe to the page, leave a five-star review. Y'all know what to do. Courtney, what's going on? Welcome back. You feel Thank a little you. more relaxed now? No, I mean, it's rest- been a busy, busy week and owners meetings just kind of wrapping up, you know, it's a two day sprint and there's so much there. And I feel like we're still kind of like piecing it all together, but the pro day circuit's been going on. We know that Ryan Poles was at LSU's pro day yeah. yesterday. So he got to see Malik neighbors run that four, three, five 40, which is incredibly impressive. Um, and, and, you know, if that's the route that the bears go at nine, I know there's some conversation about could Malik neighbors be the first wide receiver off the board. Who knows? I mean, I still think it's Marvin Harrison Jr. I think Neighbors or Dunze will go second. Um, but maybe the testing versus not testing uh, thing will come into play here uh, as far as like what a tiebreaker could be for either of the top two receivers that are projected to go in the draft in the top 10. But it's interesting. I mean, there's UNC's pro day. The Bears, I know that Kerry Joseph will be there. The yeah. polls will not. But I think as you're starting to like see this stuff more, because I know a lot of people are like, well, are they still considering other quarterbacks? To my knowledge, they did not meet with Jaden Daniels at LSU's Pro Day. Ryan Poles isn't going to UNC to, to talk with Drake May. I mean, I'm sure that the team will have some interaction there, but it is all like all signs continue. Nothing's changed. Like everything continues to point towards Caleb Williams being their guy next month. Well, and even the report that we got uh, from Rappaport yesterday about the teams that he's going to be meeting with, right? Jaden Daniels not meeting with the Chicago Mm -hmm. Bears uh, uh, post-pro day workout. Yeah. I thought that that was very interesting and, if anything, very telling because when you look at the um, – the, the fact that they're not – that Ryan Poles isn't going out to see Drake May, not that – I said this yesterday too. It's not that – you can't get a report back that makes you want to meet with one of these guys or want to talk to one of these guys. Cause that's kind of how Pat Mahomes ended up coming up in Kansas city. But mm-hmm. when the GM kind of goes, nah, we don't, we don't really need to talk to you. We're, we're set. I think that that's very telling on where they're going at the quarterback. position. It's, it's a perception thing too. Like I, I think that if you look at it, it's like, all right, where are they dedicating their resources to right now? Right now, all of the resources and the contingent that they sent out to USC for the pro day and the amount of time that they spent with Caleb Williams, they're not doing that with their highest level of decision makers for these other prospects at the quarterback position. Now, that doesn't mean you're right. Like pro days are a formality. The private workouts, the private pro days that can sometimes be scheduled, uh, sometimes teams will schedule them, the private workouts, which I I did think was kind of interesting. I asked... I asked, I think it was, I think it was uh, Ryan Poles, like just because remember last year they spent so much time with Darnell Wright Yes. after Easter, like they sent Chris Morgan down, they sent Ryan Poles down, they did like a whole, they put him through the the ringer to see like how he would respond to that. And he did really well, but he said, Poles said as of right now, they don't have any of those scheduled just yet, but it's not to say that they won't. That's what I think is going to start telling you. Okay. Who might they be looking at at number nine? Which positions, as we know, it's the needs are finding another wide receiver, an offensive tackle, and a defensive end. Once we start to hear about things that they schedule there, that's going to mean more than like any of the other, like, oh, did they show up to this person's pro day? Did they meet with this prospect? Like where they dedicate their resources, it's kind of like following a paper trail because that'll tell you who they're really interested in versus who they might be doing kind of the mere formality portion of the of the draft you know, research process on and, and point to, you know, who they might be looking at for certain spots, considering they don't have a lot of draft picks and they got to, you know, use that stuff wisely. Now, are we going to regret not going out and sending a full on contingency to see, wait for it, JJ McCarthy? <laughs> I think they did have a pretty sizable contingent there last week and his pro day is, you know, he's such a great unknown. Like he, he looked good throwing at his pro day, but again, it's routes on air. It's the pro day. It's a pro day. Like it doesn't yeah. really tell you the story of how a guy 
looks in it will look in a game we've seen plenty of guys have awesome pro days what was it anthony richardson hitting the roof last year at his like oh. who cares but they had a pretty sizable contingent there i know that you know a lot of people from the front office a lot of people from the coaching staff and and jj mccarthy continues to be this unknown of where he'll go all of the buzz that we heard in orlando about him being the second quarterback off the board could that just be a smoke screen at this time Probably. I think Jaden Daniels is a better pro prospect, but who knows? By the end of this, we may say JJ McCarthy is the greatest thrower of these quarterbacks because we haven't seen it yet. So maybe there is a part of his skill set that once he gets to the NFL and he gets in the right system and it's unleashed, we all will look back saying, wow, how did, how did he fall? Or how did he, you know, this is the reason that he climbed up the draft boards. Like, but we just didn't see it in college. There's nothing that jumps off the page. It's like, oh, my God, this guy's a complete unicorn. The way that we talk about with Anthony Richardson, why a team like the Colts, you know, use the top 10 pick on a guy who has incredible traits. Same thing with Josh Allen a couple of years ago. There really can't, isn't that same argument to be made about J.J. McCarthy unless it's like, all right, we know that it, he, you know, the byproduct of Michigan's offense and it being so run heavy with Blake Corum that that's why they didn't let J.J. McCarthy be the best version of himself. But we'll no. see. It's. That was really interesting how that kept kind of filtering through um, the Ritz Carlton and JW in Orlando because of how how often that was being talked about and how intrigued certain teams are to to see if that really does happen at two or at three. This is the this is what I like to call the Patrick Williams effect. The unknown of a player is so much better than the known because right. now your imagination gets to run wild. What we know about JJ McCarthy is he's a solid player. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and say he's bad. He throws a football. Well, but like he's solid. Yeah. I mean, like, but the unknown of like, oh, Michigan, unknown guy, where have we heard this before? Is he the next Brady? Sure. It's like, all right, guys. And he so left Michigan as the best quarterback they've had in, in, Fran, in the history of the school. So yeah. that's, I think, part of it too that feeds into this conversation about. Did you know who's going to be the one who gets which team's going to be the one who gets the steal in JJ McCarthy because he doesn't generate that same sort of buzz for like known qualities that the other four quarterbacks do? Yeah, no, uh, we want to let you guys know that uh, this episode is brought to you by the Hard Rock Casino in Northern Indiana, Las Vegas style gaming, just 30 minutes from Soldier Field, exit six right off of I 80 90. All right, Courtney, so now we've got, I, I think for the most part we feel like we've got the answer at where the bears are going. Number one, maybe there is still some stem of content or uh, uh, of the fan base that believes there's a trade back for Jaden Daniels is coming. But at this point, I think most people are all in on Caleb Williams is coming to the Chicago bears. Mm -hmm. Is this outside of just everything that the bears have put together? Another great thing that's falling in the bears favor that they have the hall of fame game which means they have to start working earlier. They have to get extra time in. And will we see the Chicago Bears actually take preseason seriously because of the rookie quarterback? I think, I mean, you have to if you have a rookie quarterback. That guy needs reps. Um, does that mean he's going to play every snap of every game? No, that never happens. Tyson Bajan will get a lot of good run in the preseason too. They still love him as a backup quarterback. But so here's what Matt Eberflew said, because the schedule's not out just yet, like officially, but we do know. So that Hall of Fame game is August 1st. So the teams that go that are playing in Canton, which will be the Bears and the Texans, they start training camp early, which means that they end OTAs and minicamp earlier. So according to Flus, what they're going to do adjusting the schedule, mandatory minicamp. So that's the three days. Sometimes it's two. Sometimes they let them go a little early, but it's a three days, the first week of June, which would be fourth, fifth, and sixth. And then you have the rookie stay beyond that for one final stretch of OTAs, which is June 10, 11, and 12. So all of that said, like they're just flipping the schedule and then you end up bringing the rookies back early. So they come in like the 17th of July and then the first full squad is probably eh, July 20th. And then that gives them about two and a half ish weeks before that game in in Canton. And I know it's a long stretch. So like, you've got to be mindful of that, the work that they're asking these players to do. And when we talk about taking the preseason seriously, they've got to make sure that they're managing reps, make sure that they're not putting themselves in a situation where guys are not coming back fresh from the off season program. Cause that's not a lot of time, like basically a month until everybody's back in full swing. Right. 
and it'll be good for the rookies. Like, but I, you know, the, the thing about this draft class and people look at it right now and say, Oh no, there's only four picks. Like how, how difficult can it be to integrate people into, you know, four picks? I mean, you, you're integrating a quarterback number first and foremost, which is going to take a lot of time, a rookie quarterback coming from college where the game is different. Yes. They have talent around them and there will be, you know, there are the guys coming into a team that, you know, have finished really well by and large yeah. compared to where they started last year. But that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be a ton of work. So I think the amount of work that they're getting in for their younger players and, and even the second year players who are going to make that jump, whether it's Javon Dexter, you know, taking over the three technique position and certainly Darnell Wright, you know, playing every snap last year, the way that Braxton Jones did the year before, how he looks going into year two and what conditioning looks like for some of these guys is going to be the main points that we're looking at to like emphasize what, you know, how this team's going to look going into the season, but they're, they've got to gear up for like a haul here because the season won't start until, you know, right around like September 11 or 12. That's more than a month. That's like almost like seven weeks that they will have been in an off season in their training camp program. And that's a lot of good work to be had. And what we know is that they don't, you know, they don't shy away from playing rookies on this team. That's Matt Ebert. They kind of had to, they will, by the time this is over, they will have, I think 25 draft picks in their first three years. A lot of those guys making early contributions right away. Yeah. That's, you know, the way that you get guys up to speed is by letting them play in the preseason until you feel like there's a, a level of comfort where you can pull them and make sure that like nobody gets hurt. But I uh, I think that we're – I mean, it's just we haven't seen a rookie quarterback. Like, thinking about Justin Fields playing in the preseason a couple of years ago, he was in, in the middle of a quarterback controversy. Yeah. Which was – which is not going to be the case this time around. So, Caleb Williams is going to end up getting all of those reps, all the reps he wants, so they can make sure that he's ready to go come week one. Yeah, I think that's, that's what is – my biggest fear is that they kind of keep this same philosophy they've had even last year, right? Like Tyree Stevenson, he got some run in the preseason, but it wasn't a great amount of run, right? You look at Javon Dexter, they end up getting some run, but it wasn't a great amount of run. They just felt like the philosophy around preseason was just like, these are four weeks that we have to go through. We want you guys to be healthy week one. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the thing that I, I just, I don't feel like you can do that one instituting a new op not a new offense per se, I guess. But, but, yeah, but I mean, that's a, that's a lot of new with a new yes. offensive coordinator. It might be the same, same concepts to a, to a large different degree, language, but though. like different language that takes a yeah. year for guys to learn. And you have a brand new quarterback learning that. So yeah. it, no, it's, you're definitely not over, like over, overdoing it. No, I mean that you can't simplify that. And, and that's, that's to me what I think is just like, has flu shit. Listen, the hair changed. The fade is here. We got good beard game going on. I love it. Somebody definitely got it. Flu's here. That's that was a wife. He move. said it was his wife. Yeah. Flu's wife was like, come on, dog. You're the head coach <laughs> of the Chicago Bears. You can't go out there in a t shirt and like flip flops every week and call it a day. I love it though. I love it. My wife did the same thing. She was like, you got to dress better. I, was like, I don't, I'm a podcaster. I don't have to. But, uh, but no, I just, I think that the focus is that maybe we saw last year. I don't know. Do you feel like it, it almost feels like Flus can't take that philosophy in because the season started so poorly. If you have a resurgence of what you saw last year, where it feels like you're on a one in four, one in five start mm -hmm. to the season, you're in a really bad position if you're Matt Eberflus at that point. Yeah, I mean, they, they would be a nightmare scenario if things happen the way that they did last year. And I believe that at least starting with the quarterback spot, they feel like they're in a position where that won't be the case because no. there were moments in training camp where we saw the offense just really struggle. Yeah. Like DJ Moore and Justin Fields built chemistry early, like dating back to the preseason or dating back to, you know, May and OTAs, but it's not like that showed up consistently. And certainly the first couple of weeks of the year, like they had trouble finding him, but they, they know like what's at stake here. Year three is such a big, like it has to be such a big jump for this organization in order to put, you know, like to, to justify what they did the last two years. And I think the whole idea that like, you know, remember Ryan Poles was on Pat McAfee show the oh, other yeah. day. And he said that it really pissed him off that this notion, like the Robert Griffin third comments of, 
this cycle's continuing. Like, and I and I think that it's not fair that people are lumping Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus until they do something that like is, you know, following that same path. Why would you say, oh, they're just going to do the exact same thing when they've shown you through their actions that they are trying to do things differently? Will it work out? We don't know yet, but I, I think that that goes into the whole idea of how they have to approach training camp, how they have to approach the preseason, where they want to set themselves up for success so they're not the same old Bears. So they're not the team that started out 0-4 last year and had all of this, like all of these off-field distractions with the coaching staff. And then, of course, Justin Fields calling out the coaches after the you know second week of the season. Learning from that, learning to like not get to that place, which again, you're starting over with a new quarterback. So it's not like it's going to be an issue of a lack of communication or rather like two things not lining up, whether it was, you know, what the Bears were asking Justin Fields to do versus how he was trying to play the game. Like you're not going to have all of those problems that you did the year before. So I think that makes it, I don't want to say easier, but I do think that that makes, they, it puts them in a better position to be able to not have to deal with any of that nonsense during training camp and be able to take the preseason for what it is, but also put put some stock into it to make sure that your roster, which you finally feel is in a good place to go, you can develop the depth behind the starters and you could feel confident knowing what your team looks like going into week one. Yeah. And, and I think that it's when, when you sit there and now you're, you're in a position with these young players being able to just like, get that chance to really get them into shape. Like week one this season should be an entirely different week one. That's all I'm saying. We need an entirely – like week one looked unprepared. That's yeah, the worst agreed. part of week one. Agreed. No, and, and I mean, God, you could hear it from the Green Bay players and how they <laughs> talked about it from their perspective. No, the Bears look stunned that that happened. And, you know, going into – Going into the year, they talked up a pretty big game and were pretty confident that they were ready to go. And yeah. then when they weren't, it was, oh, like, look, we're still, you know, we're still in the, <laughs> it was not like a complete course correct. Yeah. Um, but this time around, they've gone through the hard part and the hardest part will be integrating a new quarterback into this offense. But you hope that since you do have the pick of the litter and yeah. probably Caleb Williams coming here, that it won't be as difficult of a transition as it would have been keeping Justin Fields in this offense or, or or doing something that, you know, had more of a gamble to it. Yeah. Let's get into our road to the draft because I think that goes perfectly into the road to the draft today. Road to the draft brought to you by Toyota. Let's go places. Courtney, they, there's it feels like there is an overwhelming belief in what Ryan Poles is doing here, that Caleb Williams is going to come into an amazing situation but there's a lot of draft capital that is not here for the Chicago Bears mm -hmm. this year. Four picks in the draft this year. If you believe that there are the amount of players that we all think are that are in this draft that will be impact players in the NFL for years to come, could you see the Chicago Bears, instead of trading this year's draft capital, possibly trading future draft capital to try and get back into this draft? Of course, we have that Panthers pick next mm -hmm. year, which is going to be very valuable because no one, I don't think anybody believes the Panthers are going to sure. figure it out. That'll be a high year. 40s or excuse me, like high. You might be in the 30s. Yeah, right high 30s <laughs> yeah. or you know, mid 30s, 33 and on. Yeah, yeah, 33 to 40, somewhere in there. All right, so like we know for next year, the three additional picks that they have, that Panthers pick, they've got a six from the Dolphins, which I think yep. was for the Dan Feeney trade last year. And then a six that could turn into a fourth from the Steelers. Um, from Justin Fields. Now, to trade your own picks right now in 2025, you've got a, you know, next year's draft capital is not worth this as much as this year's draft capital. So that might have you, that might alter what they. Yeah. yeah, you might have to give more than you're necessarily comfortable doing. Like right now, they are in a good spot where they have all of the picks next year. But if there is a player, like I personally believe that at nine. If the guy, if there's not a guy that they were like head over heels, oh my God, we can't believe he fell to us. I think that they trade back at, at nine. I think that that is, there's just such a large amount of ground for them to make up from like nine to 75. And it's not comfortable sitting there and sitting there and sitting there waiting as all these good players come off the board. I mean, hell, we yeah. saw it last year, like when they had the gap between 10 and 64. 
um, or six, yeah, 64 with the Panthers second round pick that they got or third round pick that they had, they traded up to go get Tyreek Stevenson. And that was because that was a player they knew would not be there later on. I was like after drafting Jervon Dexter, then going to get Tyreek Stevenson um, and, and going about it that way. If that's the, if that, if there's somebody that they covet, they're going to have to move things around and potentially with the picks that they have next year, as I was just looking at it, like you have your own first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, yep. and all of the other picks that you, you know, that's a three, six, it's a nine pick draft class. If you include the picks that they were able to trade to get via trades, I think you'd be comfortable doing that. If you're Ryan polls, knowing that you need impact players right now. Not saying that you have to go build a roster that like contends for a Super Bowl next year, but seven wins to nine wins to ten wins to to a wild card berth for this team should be should be something that, that they're envisioning. Like let's get there first. But um, all of that, of course, hedges on whether the quarterback is as good as advertised and if he can come in here and have success right away. And as we've seen so far, they are putting a lot of offensive infrastructure around this guy. But that doesn't mean he's going to have to score a ton of points every single game, like having a really good defense yeah. helps, helps the young quarterback a ton. And I think that that's going to be maybe bigger than anything else. What Caleb Williams benefits from. Yeah. I think that when you look at even it's almost like bears fans kind of believe that there's going to be this step back in the because, defense. because of a rookie quarterback coming because, in. Let me make right. sure I understand that because this is not like, I can understand it. If you are looking at a team that typically has a number one overall pick, this isn't a two and 15 team that Caleb yeah. Williams is coming to. So I just, I, it's like, I get it until you then like start to look at the actual facts of, Oh wait, this is not a bad team. Yeah. And, and that, that has I think, like some really good players that just got paid and it's not a team comprised of a bunch of one to two year guys just to fill out a roster the way that this team had to do two years ago. I mean, the that, Texans were like that last year. Exactly. They just happened to get, you know, an anomaly in CJ Stroud. Like that doesn't that I that's such like a non sequitur when people look at that and say, well, they're going to take a step back. Rookie, I'm, and I'm, I'm not saying that rookies like a rookie quarterback is going to struggle. There are going to be growing pains. Yes. Everybody's had them from. He's going to have a bad game, guys. Yes, and, <laughs> and there will be times where he probably throws multiple interceptions, and that might cause this fan base to melt down because I just still think it's a pretty polarized group where. You have people who are going to look at Justin Fields and what he does in Pittsburgh, what he doesn't do, but like all of that to say, well, he could have been on our roster. He could have taken advantage of this team that Ryan Poles has built, but that doesn't mean that he would have been flawless in year four with the bears, but you got to give a rookie quarterback, no matter what situation they're going into grace to learn how to play the game at the professional level. Cause if you don't, then, then, then every mistake, every misstep is going to be magnified. And yeah. that pressure that's on the quarterback, like, of course, they have to bring somebody in that they know can handle the outside pressure. And, and in addition to the internal pressure to, like, get this team one step closer to getting, you know, finally being on track consistently, it's not easy. It's not going to be easy for Caleb Williams. Like, I, I, the, I hope he doesn't make the same mistake that Justin Fields made after that first preseason game when he said, oh, it kind of felt slow. I hope that he doesn't make that mistake because – not that like you can blame somebody for at least being honest in that moment, but there's always going to be people who keep receipts on that and then like are ready to slap you in the face with a reality check the first second they get. And that's not a fun spot for any athlete to be in, especially one that's transitioning to the another to an another level. Yeah. And, and I think here's the thing. You have to almost separate team expectations from Caleb expectations. I know there's, that sounds crazy. No, but I, but I think you're right on that. Here's here was here's my logic on all of it. We've watched a lot of bears teams here in chicago we've watched bears teams that had no quarterback that we knew were only going to be able to run the football that we knew the offensive line was going to struggle in pass pro but was going to be a lead and run pro and we had expectations of 10 wins why did we have expectations of 10 wins because briggs and erlacher and harris and and like peanut are all on the team and you know that's going to be a top five defense you can win a lot of games with a top five defense I expect the defense to take a step. Mm -hmm. Having a top defense in the NFL can afford you a lot of mistakes from a rookie quarterback. Sure. A rookie quarterback who also, in making some of those mistakes, is going to get bailed out more times than not because everywhere he looks, there's weaponry there. So when I say I have an expectation of the Bears being a 9-10 to 10 win team, it has nothing to do 
with Caleb Williams. Because guess what? If Tyson Bagent was in there, I'd be like, there's a lot of weapons for him to throw to. It's going to be tough for him to screw up. I still have that expectation because I think that the team itself is better than the player itself. And we can't act like we haven't seen a mid to mediocre quarterback have success in the NFL by going out there and having a top five defense, a top defense in the NFL on the other side. Heck, Joe Flacco got paid a hundred million freaking dollars because of it, because he was not a great quarterback in Baltimore. He just Mm -hmm. knew I don't have to screw up. I just got to do enough. Yeah, no, I'm with you. And that's, I think that's part of the, like, the benefit for a rookie quarterback coming in to what I just said. They don't have to be the number one scoring offense and and all of that falling on him. Did they add run support this year with DeAndre Swift? They did. And I think it is a very, very prudent play. And I'm curious to see how this works out. Like, they clearly view him as the, you know, the every down back, the guy who's going to be getting a majority of these carries coming off a career year and a Pro Bowl year. But how they divvy up those, like what the run game looks like. I think Matt Eberflus, when I asked him about that, didn't give a whole lot, but there were, you know, they've got to adjust. It's not Justin Fields as your team's leading rusher this year. And probably won't be Caleb Williams, which is good, I think. But all of that said, that the offensive burden is going to pale in comparison to when you have in a a top defense on the other side, because you are going to have more opportunities. If this is as opportunistic of a defense as it was last year, you're going to get the ball back more often. You're going to get your defense getting their offense off the field and and turning them over, you know, taking the ball away, getting you in better field position so the offense can go to work. Caleb comes into a great situation in Chicago because he doesn't have to worry about having to do it all by himself and in ways that other rookie quarterbacks, like if we're going off of, you know, one thing I thought was kind of interesting when we talk about like top quarterbacks, remember Thomas Brown, who is the bears passing game coordinator. Yep. He was the OC in, in Carolina last year. And a yep. big reason that they wanted him on the staff is because he just did this with Bryce young. I don't think that that's a small detail that you can overlook. I think that's honestly a very, very big thing. And all, you know, when I say all of that, I look at, I look at how they can, you know, utilize his knowledge of how, like basically what not to do. Like he's seen like the worst of it with Bryce young. Now he's going to have a chance to like say, okay, this didn't work. This is why this will work with Caleb Williams. And having that defense too is also part of like the overall equation as to why the bears are putting a younger quarter, a young quarterback in better position to succeed. Yeah. And and I, I just, there's so much here now. There's so much here where even if he, like I've said a couple of times, it's going to be hard for him to fail. It's going to be, it's not going to be difficult for him to see successes and it's not going to be difficult for him. Listen, there's some teams on this schedule this year that he's probably going to look really good against. Mm -hmm. We don't know how it all falls out, but like there's still some bad football teams on the schedule that the bears are going to be going up against and he's going to have some opportunities to go out there and show something with. So, I'm I'm really excited for for Caleb to come into this team because I think that this is a team that's actually set up for the quarterback to grow and to develop and to make all of the mistakes. <coughs> Excuse me. And and you're going to have those moments where he makes a mistake and the defense gets it right back for him this season. Yeah. Like that's and the part that's going to excite me the most. There were moments and, where they did that for Justin Fields last year. The offense oh yeah. just couldn't carry its weight. Like this it, the thing is this defense and all of the pieces that are back, you know, they need another, they need a couple more pass rushers. So that's something if you want to keep an eye and we know, we know Jadavian Clowney just signed with the Panthers yesterday, whatever they're doing, like they're loading up on defensive players. Um, it'll be interesting if this team, but that, the Brian Burns. Yeah, I, mean, but yeah, don't need I, don't, I don't get it. Um, but no, I mean, the bears could add a vet here or there, but like that also could be, if we're circling back kind of to the first point we made, you know, the defense showed last year that it's capable of doing all of those things of helping the offense do its job. The offense just couldn't carry its weight. You have the majority of this defense back next year, except you've really got to make sure that you find somebody to rush the passer opposite Montez sweat. And then the three, if, if Javon Dexter's not ready for that role full time at three technique, you got to find somebody who is, um, that can help. I think a lot of things as far as how this defense can like continue on the trend that we saw, you know, starting the halfway point of the season. 
I don't know if we've had this conversation on here. Maybe we have, but we'll we'll run it back here and say, is there any chance that the answer opposite Montez Sweat could be just re-signing Unique and Gakwe once he ends up getting healthy? Is there anything to that question. where I mean, listen, like when you see the pass rushers coming off of the board, it's like, all right, well, who are you gonna get that's a maybe a, a better veteran than Demarcus Walker at that position? Unique is still gonna be good. It's not like he had a a uh, uh, ACL tear or anything like it was a it was a bone break. Guys come back from breaking bones all the time. That's nothing crazy to see mm -hmm. him come back and still be a similar kind of player. Opposite Montez Sweat, he was definitely a much better pass rusher. Yeah, <clears throat> and I think for most of his career, those high sack numbers usually come with somebody elite on the other side. He's going to be 29 this year. I mean, it is an ankle injury, and he broke it week. Like week thirty, what was the 13, it was the, the think, home the home Detroit game? So yeah. I don't know what his recovery time from that is going to be. But like again, the options are pretty limited right now. We do have to wait to see what they do in the draft because yeah. signing a vet after nine, more or less, like let's think about like the ninth overall pick, unless they're able to trade back and get another first round pick, yeah. you know, or pick swap and then something else. We'll see. Uh, the quarterbacks and the way that they could come off the board could actually really benefit the Bears in trying oh, yeah. to recoup some of that draft capital so they can still get a defensive end that can start day one from round one or maybe even early round two. But the Ngakwe one, I have not heard anything about that, but it, it was unfortunate because you just started to see things coming, like falling into place when Ngakwe and Sweat were rushing opposite one another. And that was so short-lived, but – if the Bears feel that they can, you know, get that again with with, with when Ngakwe is healthy, then maybe they entertain it, and they probably don't have to overpay, considering it was his first season with. Um, like he'd had, I think, at least like seven and a half sacks each season since yeah. you know he got to the NFL, and you know how well he played with the Raiders, how well he played with the Colts the last couple of years before coming to Chicago. wasn't just his, It wasn't just on him, but he just wasn't that productive. Yeah. wasn't like, but there's you know they need more pass rushers however they can get them they need them and, and having demarcus walker in the fold he's on a two-year contract that's a, good, that's a good thing but i that's not like the only answer that you have at that position i, I know I, I tweeted something about that and somebody like got really like frustrated with me like what about demarcus walker i'm like yeah he's a guy he's a guy here on this team he's somebody got frustrated team. with you on twitter Courtney? Like, like, like the idea that, i know the idea that like you don't you have to upgrade the pass rusher position. Like I, yeah. I, I just don't want to hear it. Like there's, you need to get somebody else in. Like this group is not at all complete just yet. There's this weird belief out there that good enough is good. Like it, I guess it's not weird. Cause like, it's kind of like the bears believe that last year as well. Like good enough is good enough. And mm -hmm. you don't need to upgrade that. Is Braxton Jones good enough? Sure. Is there better out there? Absolutely. Is sure. Demarcus Walker good enough? Sure. Is there better out there? Absolutely. And I think that what Ryan Poles has done, and, and he's still going to continue to do this, right? You're not going to plug every hole every year. Um, you're just trying to plug as many of them as you can in, in one season. Maybe Demarcus Walker is the stay piece this season until you upgrade next season, unless Dallas Turner falls to you at nine. Maybe then that changes your scenario. Like Ryan Poles has so many scenarios worked out that if this happens, we have to do this. If mm -hmm. this like last year, it was we had no idea Roshan would fall this far. We got to sure. go up and get this guy. Sure. Like we hear about this every year from him. So I'm not surprised. Uh, um, that I, <laughs> it's just funny to me hearing people on Twitter just like, well, he was good enough. It's like. Yeah, like you don't want to just get by with good enough. Like that's this is your chance to reset in a lot of different areas. Do you think we could see what? What do you think is more likely? We see him trade uh, um, some kind of capital to get more picks in this draft, whether future or uh, uh, draft capital that's here, or we see him kind of do what he's done the last his first couple of years as a GM. He's going to hold on to his picks until something pops up mid season where some team's blowing something up. And we see a trade made possibly for some of that high draft capital. Yeah, I mean, he, he that'd be he'd be worrying about 2025 picks at that point by the trade deadline. And if this, you know, I think that's always going to be in play. He is someone who likes likes to have a lot of draft picks. I mean, the yeah. amount that they've had double digit draft classes the last two years, that's a big deal for him. So I would imagine that if he has the opportunity to be able to get more picks, more bites at the apple, he will do that.
Yeah. I, I listen, I, I love it because more bites at the apple. I think you let go of some players that I thought were some really good guys mm -hmm. instead of Travis Bell to me. I was like, he can actually play. Like he was nice in training camp. I was I was surprised when we ended up letting him go, but you had enough pieces that you didn't have to hold on to everybody. So mm -hmm. whenever you get that opportunity, it's always good to see. Glad to see Ryan Poles doing that. Uh, also got to, before we get up out of here, I just got to talk. I know it's Bears Twitter is dumb. Like it, the, the this off season has kind of made me like sick of Bears Twitter. <laughs> like I, I'm fine with debate. I'm fine with football. I'm fine with you disagreeing with my take. Fine with you disagreeing with me. Uh, um, liking Justin Fields, fine with you being all in on Caleb Williams, whatever it is. All right, let's we, we can football. That's football. Why has it become such a conversation on everybody's sexuality in football talk because of a 22 year old kid who's at a USC game? cheering on the girls team oh he's got a pink phone case he's he's how can he be a leader of men what dog the last time half of y'all were in a locker room was in eighth grade and y'all was laughing because everybody was naked in the locker room like would y'all shut up on twitter about this dumb caleb williams take how's he gonna be a leader of men how's he gonna who's gonna respect this in the locker room are you in the locker room are you dj moore are you cole Komet? are you gerald everett are you D like wh what is happening to the place that I lo once loved that was just football debate. And every now and then there was a couple of idiots that wanted to sit there and, and say something homophobic or say something, you know, out of pocket. It feels like that is an entire sector of the Bears fan base right now. And it is really throwing me off. The video that went around, I had somebody send it, send it to me the other day because I hadn't seen it. Um, and all it is is a guy who's 22 years old having fun, vibing to some earth, wind, and fire at a basketball game. Like, the number one thing I think is great is, you know, he supports women's basketball. Like, USC women's hoops, hey, damn hey, good. Juju. One seed for a reason. <laughs> oh, yeah, Juju hey, Watkins oh. is a baller. Mm -hmm. And I – people want – because it's, like, it's, it's, a, it's a massive course correct. The people who are spewing these stupid comments and just, like, hateful rhetoric about a guy – are the ones who, by and large, are upset that the Bears are going that direction more than likely. And I also think it's because this, and I've said this multiple times, he's our first true NIL era quarterback, somebody who has already made millions of dollars before he'll ever take a snap in the NFL. The outside perception is, oh, he's entitled. He's a spoiled guy. He has had everything handed to him. That is not the case. But people look at that and say, He's showy. He's flamboyant. He's doing things that you think like, okay, you know, cut the guy's brain, cut, cut the guy's head open. You should see a football in place instead of a brain. Some people want their quarterbacks, their football players to look like that, to be robotic, to not show personality, to not be doing what he's doing, which is enjoying his life right now. The guy's about to go to work. And if all goes well, he'll be a franchise quarterback for 10 to 15 years. Having a moment where it's not about football right now. He's at the USC game. Did he have a pink phone case? Did he have, um, you know, nail polish on? Yeah. I, I think we got to start like living in the mindset of to each their own and stop just like casting stones because we don't think something makes us uncomfortable. That's, that's not real. That's not realistic. Not everything in the society is going to make you comfortable. You're not going to agree with everything. Can the guy play football? Like that's honestly all people should all start care to about. care about, should care about, and and really start like getting on that 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 mind that mindset. But I, I have no issue with it. Like I just in you know, he's he's Gen Z. Gen Z. You and I are '90s babies. So yeah. like we're in a different. We were raised a different way. Societally, we have it's been affected by different things, and it's always like the 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 previous generation is always casting stones on the generation that is currently coming up because they do things that we don't understand. It happened from the baby boomers to Gen X. It happened from Gen X to the millennials from the millennials now to Gen Z. And do they talk funny? Do they say stupid things? Do they like act a way that you're kind of like side-eyeing? Sure. We did it too, though. Yeah. Our generation had some variation of it. That was like the equivalent to how some people view 
what Gen Z does as, you know, extravagant, as flamboyant, as whatever other adjective you want to call it, it doesn't mean that he's not going to be the right fit culturally for this locker room. If the Bears didn't think that he would be that guy, why are they going out there making all of these glowing, glowingly, glowing comments where they're just like heaping praise onto this human being? If they had concerns, I guarantee they'd be a lot more guarded because they don't want to look like, hey, we're saying all this great stuff. Oh, wait, he gets here and it, it's it, it's a polar opposite. It's a failure. Then that's an admission of guilt. Then they all get fired. They're not yeah. trying to do that. So the best part about all of this stuff is that the opinions of those people on Twitter don't matter. No matter. And I think the fact that Caleb Williams hasn't reacted or responded to any of it shows you that it's somebody that can handle that sort of pressure from the outside that is critiquing his every move. He did respond to who, who was the one guy he responded to? I think it was somebody from Barstool. He said the pink, he like quote tweeted. It was like the pink phone case is crazy. And Caleb was like, your profile picture is crazy. Like, you know, good for him on that. Yourself, good for him. But it's not, it's not like he's like fighting people who are like, no. you know, coming at him for who he is and like what he likes to do. If he likes to paint his nails. I mean, he's been getting it from all angles for a long time. Crying after the, I believe it was a loss to Utah. Yeah. Um, you know, the nails, the whole thing. And it is what it is. People are going to find some reason to not like you. It's just, if you can be successful in the midst of all of that, that's the sign of somebody who, you know, the bears would be confident bringing into their building. Here's my problem with it, right? It's all the like old guys on Twitter that are like, have a hundred, uh, followers. Toxic that are, masculinity. Like, 90, like just call it what it is. Hot. It's not. No, but here's, here's my issue with it. You grew up in this generation. Like, you grew up in like, yeah, I mean, like it, it, the group that he was listening to. This is Earth, Wind, and Fire. This is what y'all grew up bumping. Y'all dressed like this. We got pictures of y'all in Big Mama House in them green pants. Like, what are y'all talking about? You can't sit here and try and cook Caleb. We can see y'all. <laughs> like, dog, it's the funniest thing in the world. I, listen, and don't have me pull up some uh some aerosmith outfits from back in the day right y'all was dressing like this and y'all got the nerve to be mad at this young man and you know what i love about it here's here's my favorite part about all of this and, and it's the one thing where i guess i do empathize with bears fans that aren't used to this mm -hmm. we're not used to superstars being superstars before they get here and that's what you hope caleb is yeah and that's what he's been we're not used to rock stars coming here. We loved Jimmy Butler because Jimmy Butler was like, he was the last man. He had to work hard. He had to figure it all out. He had to come pull himself up by the bootstraps. And all of a sudden, he's one of the best players in the NBA. We love Derrick Rose because Derrick Rose did the same thing through high school, was incredibly talented, and just kept himself on the right path. We love people that we can kind of see ourselves in. We're a very blue-collar city. There's no way for us to see ourselves in Caleb. Sure. There's no way for us to see ourselves in somebody who is a, a star, who's already right, got, got the money, got the fame, got the notoriety, right? Like we can't see ourselves in that. And so because we can't see ourselves in it, we kind of take it and say, I don't like that guy. I don't want that guy. You want to know the last guy that saw himself in the quarterback that he selected was? It was Ryan Pace. He saw a lot of himself in Mitch Trubisky. I can guarantee it. Is that what you want? <laughs> Or do you want the superstar? Let's hope he's a superstar. But I think I'm willing to take more of a chance here. Like, the, the Twitter is getting crazy. We can see y'all. And I know y'all dress like that. I'm sick of this. I'm done with it. And don't get me started on the mugs from the 90s. We got Diddy running around here. <laughs> I'm sorry, Courtney. I, I didn't want you to get caught up in that, but I've been. No, nah, but it's, I mean, as you crazy. see it everywhere, I'm with you. It's, um, it's just how many more days until the draft? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's, is it going to die after we get with the number one selection? The Chicago Bears select Caleb Williams? Probably not. But it'll. I guarantee it dies the first big game that he has, mm -hmm. at least for a week. Oh. Hit that like button, subscribe to the page, leave that five-star review. Y'all know what to do. For Courtney Cronin, I'm Pat the Designer. It's all love out here. I love every one of y'all, but some of y'all gotta relax because we can see y'all. Peace.